Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Masco Corporation's 2019 fourth quarter and full year conference call. My name is Regina, and I will be your operator for today's call. As a reminder, today's conference call is being recorded for replay purposes. To ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. I will now turn the call over to David Chaika, Vice President, Treasurer, and Investor Relations. You may begin. Thank you, Regina, and good morning. Welcome to Masco Corporation's 2019 fourth quarter and full year conference call. With me today are Keith Allman, President and CEO of Masco, and John Snubice, Masco's Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. Our fourth quarter earnings release and the presentation slides that we will refer to today are available on our website under Investor Relations. Following our remarks, we will open the call for analyst questions. Please limit yourself to one question with one follow-up. If we can't take your question now, please call me directly at 313-792-5500. Our statements today will include our views about our future performance, which constitute forward-looking statements. These statements are subject to risk and uncertainties that could cause our actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements. We describe these risks and uncertainties in our risk factors and other disclosures in our Form 10-K and our Form 10-Q that we filed with the Securities and Exchange Commission. <clears throat> our statements will also include non-GAAP financial metrics. Our references to operating profit and earnings per share will be as adjusted, unless otherwise noted. We reconcile these adjusted metrics to GAAP in our earnings release and presentation slides, which are available on our website under Investor Relations. Finally, please note that we have accounted for our windows and cabinetry businesses as discontinued operations for all periods presented. With that, and I'll turn the call over to Keith. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'll begin with some brief comments on our fourth quarter before I turn to our full year results and conclude with our thoughts on 2020. As Dave mentioned, our financial results have been restated to reflect cabinetry and windows as discontinued operations for all periods presented. Turning to slide four, in the fourth quarter, our top line increased 1%, excluding the impact of currency, driven by solid growth in North American plumbing and paint. In line with our expectations, operating profit was down and our operating margin was 15.7% in the quarter. As we previously communicated, this was due to higher input costs due to the full impact of tariffs and an increase in variable costs as compared to the fourth quarter of 2018. Our earnings per share for the quarter matched prior year at $0.54 cents per share. Turning to our segments, plumbing growth in the fourth quarter was led by our North American plumbing business, which grew 5%. This was driven by record sales for both Delta and Watkins. Delta experienced growth in trade, retail, and e-commerce in the fourth quarter, and Watkins continued to outperform the market with its industry-leading portfolio of products across price points and channels. In our decorative architectural segment, Bayer continued to perform well with mid-single-digit pro-paint growth and low-single-digit DIY growth. This was aided by increased year-end ordering that pulled forward sales from Q1 of 2020, similar to what we experienced last year. We saw good results from the recently reset color solution centers, as well as other new innovations, such as our Easy Pour paint can and our new Bear Ultra Scuff Defense paint. Our paint growth was offset by lower sales in our lighting business, an industry that has been significantly impacted by tariffs. Lastly, for the fourth quarter, we made significant progress on our strategic plan by completing the sale of our Milgard Windows business for after-tax net proceeds of approximately $560 million and signing an agreement to sell our cabinetry business for $850 million in cash at closing and preferred stock with a liquidation value of $150 million. We now expect the cabinetry sale to close by the end of February. With the proceeds from the sale of Milgard and our strong free cash flow, we executed share repurchases of $456 million in the quarter 
and retired approximately $200 million of debt that was scheduled to mature in early 2020, further strengthening our balance sheet and reducing our interest expense. We were pleased with our fourth quarter performance, and it concluded a transformational year for MASCO. Please turn to slide five. As we look back on the full year, we effectively navigated this challenging year while executing our strategy to transform MASCO into a stronger, more stable, less cyclical, and higher return building products company. For the full year, sales grew 2%, excluding the impact of currency, largely driven by pricing actions as we mitigated the impact of tariffs and other inflation. Despite the challenges of increased tariff costs and slower end markets, Delta, Hans Groy, Bayer, and Watkins each achieved record sales for the year. Delta gained share with Bath Fixtures at retail and its Brizo brand in showrooms, while also expanding its line of voice-enabled faucets. Hans Groy launched several new products early in 2019, helping to drive solid growth, particularly in Germany and China. Our innovation excellence was demonstrated at the recent Kitchen and Bath Industry Trade Show, or KBiz, as we earned two of the Best of KBiz Awards. Our Brizo brand won the KBiz Best of Show Award for its new Kinsu Bath Collection, and our Hans Groe brand won the KBiz Impact Award for its Rainfinity Shower System. Watkins, our leading spa business, also had another outstanding year, driven in part by innovations such as its freshwater salt system. This unique water care system provides a maintenance-free, disposable cartridge that uses less chemicals to provide a simpler and cleaner spa experience. Bayer continued to perform well in 2019, driving high single-digit growth in ProPaint. ProPaint is a large growth opportunity for us, and we will continue to invest in people and capabilities, along with our partner, the Home Depot, to gain share in the ProPaint market. While we were pleased with our paint performance in 2019, the lighting category was one of the hardest hit by tariffs, and this impacted our results. The headwinds we experienced in lighting in the quarter will continue for the next three quarters as we exit certain private label SKUs and expect some inventory reduction to occur in the retail channel. As we outlined in our investor day, we believe that our performance in lighting will stabilize by the end of 2020, and we will be positioned to return to growth at that point. Wrapping up our 2019 performance, we delivered on our commitment to drive shareholder value as we increased earnings per share by 6%, executed our strategy to make Masco a better company for the long term by completing the divestitures of our Windows businesses and signing an agreement to divest our cabinetry business. And we deployed over $1.2 billion of capital by returning approximately $900 million to shareholders through share repurchases, increasing our dividend for the sixth consecutive year, and reducing our outstanding debt by approximately $200 million to finish the year at a net debt to EBITDA of 1.7 times. With our effective capital allocation strategy and strong operational performance, we achieved a return on invested capital from continuing operations of 29% in 2019. Before closing the book on 2019, I'd like to thank all of our employees, especially those at our cabinetry and former windows businesses, for all of their hard work and perseverance that made 2019 another successful year for MASCO. Now turning to 2020. I'd like to share with you our view of our markets. For the repair and remodel market, which is approximately 90% of our revenue, we expect market growth to be in the 3 to 4% in 2020, with growth accelerating in the second half of the year. For the paint market, a subset of the repair and remodel market for us, we expect the DIY paint market to be flat and the pro paint market to grow low to mid single digits. For the new construction market, 
which is approximately 10% of our revenue, we expect mid-single-digit growth as we have seen an improvement in both starts and permits, particularly in the single-family sector. As for our international markets, principally Europe, we expect, expect a flat to low single-digit growth environment. Based on these assumptions, we expect full-year sales growth to be in the range of 2 to 3%, excluding currency, margins to be approximately 16%, and earnings per share to be in the range of $2.35 to $2.55. With our strong balance sheet and the $645 million in after-tax net proceeds from the sale of cabinetry expected to be received in February, we will continue our balanced capital allocation strategy to drive shareholder value. We will likely deploy 500 to $600 million of the cabinetry proceeds towards share repurchases shortly after closing. And with our expected strong free cash flow conversion of approximately 100%, we will look to deploy up to another $600 million towards M&A or share repurchases throughout the remainder of 2020 subject to market opportunities. Now I'll turn the call over to John to go over our fourth quarter, full year, and 2020 outlook in more detail. John? Uh, thank you, Keith, and good morning, everyone. As Dave mentioned, most of my comments will focus on adjusted performance from continuing operations, excluding the impact of rationalization and other one-time items. Turning to slide seven, we finished the year on plan. Fourth quarter sales matched prior year and increased 1% in local currency. Currency translation unfavorably impacted sales in the quarter by approximately $7 million. In local currency, North American sales increased 1% in the quarter, driven by pricing actions and volume growth in our plumbing and paint businesses. This was partially offset by lower volumes in our lighting business. In local currency, international sales decreased 1% in the quarter, driven by unfavorable mix, partially offset by pricing actions. We reported operating income of $257 million, with operating margins of 15.7%. Operating profit was impacted by mix, an unfavorable price-cost relationship, and higher variable costs. For the fourth quarter, our EPS matched prior year at $0.54 cents per share. Please note that this performance is based on a normalized tax rate of 26% versus the previously guided 25% tax rate prior to discontinued operations. Due to the move of cabinetry and window segments to discontinued operations and a change in the tax rate, we have provided restated adjusted EPS numbers for 2018 and the first three quarters of 2019 in the appendix on slide 22. Turning to the full year 2019, sales increased 1% and grew 2% in local currency. Currency translation unfavorably impacted the full year by $77 million. In local currency, North American sales increased 2%. This performance was driven by disciplined pricing actions across both segments, partially offset by lower volumes. In local currency, international sales matched prior year. While we experienced some international market softness in 2019, Hansgrohe continued to drive share gains in its home market of Germany and in China. Our SG&A as a percent of sales increased 10 basis points to 18.9% for the full year. And for the full year, operating income decreased $16 million, or 1%, with operating margins of 16.5%. Lastly, our EPS increased 6% to $2.25 for the full year. Turning to slide 8, our plumbing segment grew 3% in the quarter, excluding the impact of currency driven by strong growth in North America. Foreign currency unfavorably impacted sales by approximately $9 million in the quarter. North American sales increased 5% in local currency as we experienced improved demand from our wholesale, retail, dealer, and e-commerce customers. 
This growth was against an 8% comp in the fourth quarter of 2018. Growth was led by Delta as they achieved another record sales quarter through increased volumes across their product categories. Additionally, Watkins, our spa business, continued to outperform by also achieving another record quarter with its innovative new products and industry-leading brands. Our international sales in the fourth quarter decreased 1% in local currency due to lower sales in Germany as Hans Grohe faced a difficult comp with sales growth of 7% in Germany in the fourth quarter of 2018. This was partially offset by strong growth in China. Operating profit in the quarter decreased $5 million due to higher variable costs, partially offset by incremental volume. Turning to the full year 2019, sales increased 2% in local currency. This solid growth was driven by record years at Delta and Watkins. North American sales grew 2% in local currency as a result of early and aggressive pricing actions taken to mitigate the impact of tariffs, offsetting lower volumes. Our international plumbing sales matched prior year in local currency as Hans Grohe's solid growth in Germany and China was offset by softness in other regions. Full-year operating profit matched prior year due to a favorable price-cost relationship as we priced ahead of feeling the impact of tariff costs in certain instances, partially offset by higher spending, unfavorable currency translation, and mix. For 2020, we expect the plumbing segment sales growth to be in the 2 to 4% range, excluding currency, principally due to our low growth expectations for the European plumbing market. As a reminder, 35% of the plumbing segment sales are outside of North America. We anticipate full-year margins will be similar to 2019 as we experience the full impact of the List 3 and List 4 tariffs in 2020. We expect the tariff impact will be the greatest in the first half of the year, and we anticipate operating margins will be down roughly 100 basis points in the first half of 2020 before recovering in the second half of the year. Also, given current exchange rates, we do not expect currency to materially impact our 2020 revenue. Turning to slide 9, the decorative architectural segment declined 3% in the fourth quarter. This performance was driven by strong paint sales, which were more than offset by lower sales in our lighting business due to the loss of a, of a portion of a private label business and inventory rebalancing with a key customer, which impacted volumes in the quarter by approximately $20 million. Bears solid mid-single digit growth in pro and low single digit growth in DIY products was aided by approximately $20 million of sales pulled forward from Q1 2020, similar to the pull forward we experienced in the fourth quarter of 2018. Operating income declined due to lower volumes in lighting and an unfavorable price-cost relationship driven by the impact of tariff costs and higher incentives, partially offset by lower spending. Turning to the full year 2019, sales grew 3% driven by our pro payment initiative as we achieved high single-digit growth and continue to grow share with the pro. Growth was also aided by the acquisition of Kitchener in March of 2018. This performance was partially offset by lower volumes in our lighting and build as hardware businesses as a result of our disciplined pricing actions in 2019. Full year operating income decreased 1%, principally due to lower volumes and increased commodity costs, partially offset by selling price increases and lower spending. In 2020, we expect low single-digit growth in DIY paint and mid-single-digit growth in pro paint. We also expect revenue in this segment will be impacted by the loss of a portion of a private label program and inventory rebalancing at a Kitchler customer. The revenue impact of these items will be approximately $15 million each in Q1 and Q2 and approximately $5 million in Q3. This volume loss and the full impact of tariffs will depress operating segment, mar segment operating margins by approximately 300 basis points in Q1 before recovering in the balance of the year. 
For full year 2020, we expect sales growth in the segment will be in the 0 to 2% range, with operating margins between 17 and 17.5%. In turning to slide 10, our year-end balance sheet was strong, with net debt to EBITDA at 1.7 times, and we ended the year with approximately $1.7 billion of balance sheet liquidity. Working capital as a percent of sales finished the year at 15.7%, an improvement of 10 basis points over prior year. During 2019, we repurchased 7% of our outstanding shares for approximately $900 million, and we increased our annual dividend by 13% to $0.54 cents per share. We took further action in 2019 to strengthen our balance sheet by reducing our debt by approximately $200 million, and we initiated a plan to terminate and annuitize our U.S. Qualified Defined ben Benefit Pension Plans. We should complete this plan by the end of 2021. This will reduce our ongoing pension expense and contributions once completed. Lastly, we expect the sale of our cabinetry business to close in February, and we expect net proceeds from the sale of approximately $645 million after taxes and expenses. Going into 2020, our disciplined capital allocation strategy is unchanged. We will continue to prioritize investment in our businesses to drive organic growth. We will balance acquisitions with the right strategic fit in returns with share repurchases. And we will maintain an appropriate dividend. Including the expected net proceeds from the sale of our cabinetry business, we expect to deploy up to $1.2 billion for share repurchases in 2020, subject to market conditions. This activity would bring our expected 2020 average share count to between 265 and 270 million shares. We generated $660 million of free cash flow in 2019, and we expect a 100% free cash flow conversion rate in 2020. Lastly, for the full year 2020, we expect annual revenue growth of 2 to 3% with operating margins of approximately 16%. And as Keith mentioned earlier, our 2020 EPS estimate is $2.35 to $2.55, which represents 9% EPS growth at the midpoint of, that, of the range. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Keith. Thank you, John. 2019 was a dynamic and transformational year for MASCO. We mitigated significant tariff headwinds faced by our plumbing, lighting, and hardware businesses. We continued to grow our plumbing segment with record sales at Delta, Hans Grohe, and Watkins. We continued to gain share in pro and DIY paint with our leading Bear brand. We simplified our portfolio with the divestitures of our windows businesses and signed an agreement to sell our cabinet business and we continue to execute on our capital allocation strategy. As we enter 2020, the fundamentals of our business and our core repair and remodel market are healthy. Consumers remain confident and wages are growing. Home price appreciation is increasing. Housing stock continues to age. Existing home sales have improved, and household formations have steadily increased. With these favorable fundamentals and our continued focus on executing our strategy, coupled with our strong balance sheet and liquidity, we will continue to create shareholder value in 2020 and are well positioned to deliver on our 2021 EPS target of $2.80 to $3 that we put forth at our Investor Day last September. With that, we'll now open the calls up for Q&A. In order to ensure that everyone has a chance to participate, we would like to request that you limit yourself to asking one question and one follow-up question during the Q&A session. To ask a question, please press star then the number 1 on your telephone keypad. To withdraw your question, please press the pound key. Our first question will come from the line of Stephen Kim with Evercore ISI. 
Yeah, thanks very much, guys, and appreciate all the uh, all the detail here. Um, I guess uh, first question really relates to uh, the margin guidance uh, that you've given. Um, I'm curious, uh, first of all, uh, when you look at the uh, the kitchen business, I guess, within Deck Art. Um, can you give a sense for uh, what kind of a margin impact you think the, uh, the, the this private label uh, program uh, being discontinued at your retail partner, what that is representing and how much you think uh, some of the, other, uh, the, the, the margin guidance you're looking for, particularly here in the first quarter, is being driven by other impacts uh, to the margin? Yeah, yeah, Steve. Good morning. It's John. Um, you know, I think the margin impact from the loss of the private label business is relatively modest uh, because you know it is indeed a private label program. Um, I think the bigger impact on the margin in, in the segment is due to us absorbing the full cost of the, the tariffs here in the first part of the year. Thanks. And then um, uh, I guess might as well stay on the uh, on. Uh, on the deck art segment, and, and particularly Kitchler. I'm curious, as you look at that business, obviously there's a lot that's happened. Um, you know, the tariffs coming in uh, shortly after the acquisition was an unfortunate event, um, and uh, there's continuing to be uh, issues uh, in China due to the coronavirus, one can imagine affecting your supply chain. Uh, I'm curious, I guess, number one, uh, you didn't, I don't, believe you mentioned anything about the coronavirus, if you could maybe talk about how that might be factoring into your outlook if at all. And then two, if you believe that there is any adjustment or has there been any adjustment in your uh, improvement plan in Kitchler in light of what's happened as you've watched things develop over the last three months since the last time we, uh, we spoke to you, has there been any change in your strategic thinking around how to approach uh, improving the result in that business, given the changing world. Stephen, this is Keith. I'll, I'll take that, and we'll, we'll talk about uh, the coronavirus first. Um, when you think about the revenue uh, that we have in China, it's about 3% of our revenue, so I want to keep that uh, in perspective. Obviously, China plays an important role in our supply chain, so uh, it, it's, it's important to us, and it, ha and it represents about 3% of our revenue. As of now, and it is a fluid situation without a doubt, um, we are not expecting a material impact on our performance from the coronavirus. It is, it is a, a fluid situation, as I mentioned. Um, when you think about, uh, uh, first of all, in terms of our factories and where, where we stand, I guess most importantly, none of our employees, as we know, uh, sitting here this morning, have been uh, infected by the virus, and we're, we're very thankful for that. We've instituted uh, significant um, precautions, travel restriction, high, uh, hygiene guidelines. Uh, we've eliminated um, gatherings and meetings. Um, we have a, a small manufacturing force that started about 15% of, the, of our biggest factory that started uh, yesterday, and we'll be ramping that up uh, throughout the week. So that represents about a one-week delay from what we had anticipated due to the Lunar New Year. So not a significant delay, uh, but definitely a, a, a slower ramp up than we anticipated. Uh, from a supply chain perspective, uh, a very similar story uh, with our biggest suppliers, uh, where they are ramping up, they are bringing people back from uh, the countryside where they were out on, on Chinese New Year, and they're coming back, and there's a planful uh, ramp-up. So right now, uh, as I've talked to our biggest suppliers and to our own factories, we, um, we are um, cautiously optimistic, but it is a, it is a fluid situation. Um, in terms of the demand over there in China, again, that's 3% of our volume. Uh, as you may know, a lot of the building products are sold through uh, retail malls and, and, and small dealers. Um, most of those are still closed, and they will start to open up over the course of the next 10 days. Um, our sales teams are all working from home. We're reviewing uh, the revenue and the, and the orders as they come in. Um, we've reserved um, spots in terms of premium freight to help us maintain our delivery performance as we ship some of our products back to a large degree back to Germany. Um, so my point is we're taking precautions. We're thankful that none of our employees have uh, have contracted the, the virus. 
It's a serious situation. We're taking it seriously. We have contingency plans developed, and at this point where we stand, we don't expect uh, a material impact um, on our business. Um, with regards uh, to Kitchler, um, no question about it, Kitchler has been growth challenged in 2019. I mean, the overall lighting industry was significantly impacted by the tariffs, um, and um, we were firm on our pricing, and we were aggressive, one of the first out in the industry in building products in terms of, of pricing for these tariffs. And um, we did suffer a loss of a portion of our private label business. And um, as John mentioned, there is a <clears throat> an inventory rebalancing at um, one of our large customers that we expect to take place. And we've outlined the impact across the quarter. So um, certainly the, the tariffs were not expected um, when we made made this acquisition. In terms of your direct question regarding if we've changed our um, improvement approach, um, we really haven't. Um, certainly there was a change as it relates to pricing for tariffs, but I've already discussed that. But fundamentally we had a, a, a work plan to drive what we thought would be um, improvements in our cost structure and in our total cost productivity. We've done that. We're ahead of that plan, and we're going to continue to drive that, and we expect to continue to outperform our plan as it relates to productivity and costs. With regards to the top line, it's really about having the right products and the right commercial programs and relationship uh, in, in the industry. And the Kistler brand is very strong, and we have, in some cases, two and three generations of customers that we continue to serve. And it, we're focused on new products, and we've uh, reinvigorated our new product development process, we just uh, executed a launch in January, and we're ex uh, receiving very positive feedback on that. We've looked at and we've tweaked our, our dealer programs to simplify and incentivize our dealers, and our Kitchler team is very focused on, on executing this plan. So, um, with, without a doubt, there were some volume challenges in 2019. They're going to continue through the first uh, uh, two quarters, and then a little bit into the third quarter, and then. Uh, as we exit 2020, we're going to be on solid footing to return this business to growth. Great. Thanks very much. Your next question comes from the line of Matthew Bully with Barclays. Uh, good morning. Thank you for taking my questions. Um, I, I wanted to uh, follow up on, on the decorative side just around that uh, Q1 guidance uh, for the 300 basis point decline. It sounded like you're saying that that's largely reflective of the tariffs flowing through, and obviously your full-year guidance suggests that the margins will recover through the balance of the year. So I guess my question is more cadence-wise. Are, are you expecting kind of a steady improvement sequentially through the year, or is that margin improvement kind of more weighted to the end of the year as, as you anniversary those tariffs? Thank you. Sure, uh, Stephen, or Matthew, let me give you a, a little bit uh, of color here. So if you think about how um, the tariffs have impacted us starting in, in 2019 um, and how they phased through our, our P&L through the course of the tail end of 2019 and going into 2020, we had about um, $60 million of incremental tariff costs in 20, impacting P&L in 2019. We expect another incremental $90 million to impact uh, the P&L in, in 2020. And, and most of that $90 million should be in the first half of the year. I mean, if you, if you consider that $60 million started to flow through our P&L, kind of the middle of the third quarter, and really hit us, uh, the full effect hit us in the, in the fourth quarter of 2020. So we should experience the full impact in, in the first two quarters of the year, and then it uh, continued a little bit in the third quarter, and this then should dissipate as we get into the fourth quarter of last uh, of this year. So we've implemented uh, the pricing to, to mitigate the, the full $150 million of tariffs, but we're also um, continuing to work on margin recovery efforts through cost out opportunities, supplier negotiations, and looking at other uh, resourcing opportunities that we may have. Um, the one thing that uh, I should point out is we might face a little bit of margin compression because what we are experiencing is, is cost recovery on these tariffs. So, you know, we don't have necessarily margin uh, dropping to, to the bottom line. Um, that said, we should expect uh, some, to resume some margin expansion in the back half of the year once these tariffs work their way through uh, the P&L. So I, I hope, hopefully that's helpful to you. Uh, it is. Thank, thank you for that. Um, 
And then secondly, just kind of bigger picture around uh, Kitchler, you know, just hoping you could elaborate a bit around kind of the longer term growth plans. I mean, you know, kind of how you envision this business positioned from a channel perspective or, or what, I guess, needs to change that that you think would allow this business to kind of return to growth after you've, you've moved past some of these near-term losses. Thank you. I think a uh, similar answer to how I answered Stephen's question. I think the, there there was specific events that occurred in this business as it relates to tariffs and some uh, lots of some private label business and an inventory uh, rebalancing by a significant customer. As those things, uh, particularly the, the the tariffs begin to, um, or the loss of the private label rather begins to flow out through the year, uh, this business will be on solid footing to return to growth in terms of. The specific strategies, it's really about leveraging the strong brand and the deep channel relationships that we have in Kitchler. And though the, Kitchler is, is one of the few um, businesses in this industry that <clears throat> have a broad presence across all channels. So it is a multi-channel um, strategy for us. And fundamentally at the root of that strategy is good products and great service. And we're working through different programs, as I highlighted earlier in terms of new product launches and commercial programs to drive incentives and to align. Not, um, not unlike what we did as we revamped uh, um, several years ago when we were down at Delta and went through this process uh, to revamp our product development, shore up our assortment, and make sure that our incentives were aligned to the specific needs of the channel. Uh, a little bit unique here uh, in, in lighting is the movement to, to the e-commerce channel. And we have uh, put in a leadership team, actually uh, uh, several players from Delta Fawcett Company that were instrumental in driving our shared leadership in e-business down to Kitchler. We have a great team down there, and we're focused across all channels, e-business, e uh, landscape, retail, and um, showroom. So um, it really is a multi-pronged uh, approach, but at the core of it, it's, it's commercial programs. Um, it, it go it, it, I've said it, but I'll say it again. Everything we do here at Masco is focused on productivity and cost productivity, and that will continue as Kitchler as well. That's a, a component of the plan that we're outperforming, and, and we intend to uh, continue that. So as I mentioned on my earlier answer, no significant change to the strategy. There were some defined um, events that happened to this business, and um, we're going to get through it. And at the end of the year, we're going to be on solid footing, and we're going to continue to grow. Okay, appreciate the detail. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Wood with Nomura Infinite. Hi, good morning. I wanted to um, see if you can elaborate a bit more on the incentives that you called out impacting uh, paint profitability in the presentation. And what are you seeing in terms of uh, consumer reaction to these incentives? And if you could just talk about, you know, maybe what's changed in the industry in terms of you know, how, how how competitors are behaving with, with price and incentives in paint. Uh, uh, Mike, may, uh, I think there might be a slight misinterpretation. It's incentives between um, ourselves and, and our retail partners. It's not necessarily consumer-based uh, incentives. I understand. So just to clarify that, you're saying that um, the, the actual price and incentives offered at the store have not necessarily changed. This is between that, you that's and correct. large customers. Yeah, largely due to volume rebates that we, we have uh, with our, our major customers. Great. And in terms of the um, the market share gains that we should expect going forward for the business overall, if I do just rough back the envelope math uh, for the end market assumptions overlaid to your business, I get I get a roughly 2% growth rate, and, and you know, you're calling for 2 to 3%. Is that um, the typical uh, share gain that you'd expect, or you know, is there something kind of impacting that that's preventing it from being larger? No, I mean it's, it's the share gains we 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 expect. As you recall, we've got now a a, a, a propane business that's now half dollars, and so you know it's harder. You know, as when you get to the law of large numbers, and it's harder to gain share off of that that base at the same rate. That you were uh, gaining share at when it was a much smaller business, but you know we continue to invest behind that business. Our channel partner Home Depot continues to invest behind that business. We think 
We have established a very successful and winning model to, to attract the pro contractor into their stores and to buy paint. You know, it's, it's, um, and focus them on, you know, one of the highest ranked quality, uh, brands in the, in the industry. So, you know, between ourselves and between, uh, ourselves and the Home Depot, we think we've established a, a terrific business model here. Yeah, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Mike Dahl with RBC Capital Markets. Good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, John, just to pick up on that last uh, question, if, if we think about the paint business, I think that pull forward into Q4 looks like it was uh, probably a couple cents, uh, and, and maybe you know, that's borrowing from 2020 by the same amount and, and a point of top line in that segment, I, I think. So if, if you think about paint specifically, um, you know, when you have DIY as a market flat, pro, low single to mid single flat, you've got that one point headwind. I guess, do you, do you expect to perform in line then with the, uh, with the broader paint market? Um, you know, even with that comp headwind or, or do you still think you can outperform that, um, those overall numbers? Yeah, yeah, Mike. So, you know, uh, to react to your, your comments, yeah, one, I think your math is, is largely right on the pull forward and the, the bottom line impact. And, you know, as we think about the growth in, in both DIY and pro, um, we do think we can outpace the market in, in both instances. You know, we're still, even though we're at a half a billion dollar business now, we're still, um, you know, you know, have a relatively light market share and we still think there's further share to be gained in the pro. And as we, as we look at uh, our performance on the DIY portion of the business, again, because of our alignment with the, the key, our, key you know, our channel partner, the Home Depot, and the growth rates that they're experiencing and the, the folks that they draw to their stores, we think we can outpace uh, the DIY market growth as well in here in 2020. Okay, that's helpful. Uh, second, second question, also following up on another question earlier about the um, kind of price tariff margin impact. I, I think you were answering the question in, in aggregate, including plumbing and, and lighting, uh, talking about that pace of margin and and kind of the recovery on, on tariffs. But just to clarify, is that also specifically true for plumbing? And it looks like within plumbing, you know, second part of this is, you know, your second half margins have to be up um, year on year to get to that flat full year if you're down 100. Um, and so is that um, is that incremental actions around price, supply chain, uh, raw materials uh, benefiting you, or, or is that just pure volume leverage to get you to, to that? Yeah, Mike, so, uh, again, uh, you're, you're right. My, my prior comments were about the enterprise-wide, not specifically with respect to any single segment. Um, as you break down the, the plumbing segment, um, you're right. The, 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 the margin expansion that, that uh, we expect in the second half of the year um, is required given the margin headwinds in the first half of the year due to the impact of the tariffs. What we expect in the back half of the year, that's largely volume-driven. Um, there, we don't expect any further pricing actions or uh, anything else incremental uh, outside of volume to, to drive that margin expansion in the back half of the year. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Selden Clark with Deutsche Bank. Hey, thanks for the question. Uh, just continuing on the last question, um, how should we think about volume and price uh, within your revenue guidance for plumbing and decorative? So, you know, as you think about volume, you know, I would consider most to be volume is, uh, you know, we indicated earlier, you know, with the uh, the impact of the tariffs flowing through, um, you know, we kind of laid out our, our top line estimates. I would expect uh, modest pricing, uh, very low impact at all if on pricing because of the pricing we put through on the tariffs back in 2019, early in 2019, I should say. Um and so, you know, most of that is all, uh, most of the growth that we have, have outlined for you today, both with the decorative architectural segment as well as the plumbing segment, and therefore the company in total, is, is volume driven. Okay, and then just kind of continuing on to 2021, uh, you know, you reiterated the expectation for 280 to $3 of earnings. 
Um, and I think you, you got it to something like a 16.8% underlying margin, which obviously implies another 80 basis points improvement on top of this year. What's like the right bridge to think about as uh, uh, on how to get there? Is that still going to be volume driven or are there some cost actions that you can you see down the line or pricing actions that you see down the line a little bit longer term? A couple of things that it would be <clears throat> driving our 2021 performance. Firstly, we, we anticipate that the tariff uh, headwinds are behind us. Um, in terms of the overall market, when we think about R&R, as we mentioned in the earlier remarks, we expect an acceleration through 2020, and we believe that will hold into 2021 uh, based on improving fundamentals, increase in, in our supply and the strong consumer. So with, with the tariffs behind us, the market improving um, and continued uh, growth, as we talked about it in terms of our share gain in uh, pro DIY paint and our plumbing business, with that drop down, together with our planned repurchase, share repurchases in 2021, uh, that's what gives us confidence in that 280 to $3 range for 2021. Okay, so is 16.8 still kind of the right number to think about, roughly? Yeah, I think so. Okay, appreciate the time. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Michael Rehot with J.P. Morgan. Uh, thanks. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, the first question I just had, I, I just wanted to break down uh, the, um, the the tariff impact. And, you know, I guess, uh, John, you said earlier that you uh, estimated it was about a $60 million impact in 2019 and incremental 90 in 2020. I was just trying to get a set sense for, you know the offsetting actions to those um, to those headwinds. Um, you know through you know price um, cost. Uh, you know specifically you know productivity. I think is you know if, if you want to throw that in there, if you feel that that was you know either supply chain or other things that you know you did specifically to offset. But just trying to get a sense of you know the offsetting actions there to get to like a net. Um, you know, net headwind or or, or such. Um, how, how you see that flow? How 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 did you see that flow through in 2019? And, and how do you expect the 2020 to shake out when you think of those offsetting actions? In round numbers, Mike, I, I'd say it, uh, let's call it 90 percent of our mitigation actions were through price. So that was the biggest lever that we pulled in 2019. So that leaves about 10 percent in terms of the cost of the tariffs mitigated through supply chain resourcing, negotiation with suppliers, and that sort of thing. Uh, we'll continue to do that. Um, the, the, the majority of our movement out of China is, is our existing uh, suppliers that have established um, production in other low-cost countries, and we'll be ramping that up. We'll be moving some to, to, to in, in some limited cases, to some new suppliers. Um, but th that's a longer-term play for us, and it's going to take – um, a while to do that. So fundamentally, when you think about the the mitigation, it was mostly price, and we've 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 put that through aggressively and in, in early in 2019, and hence now with the combination of the timing of the tariffs and when they hit, and more importantly the flow of inventory through our system into the P&L. That's why we have that overhang and in, in a, a, that 90 million dollar headwind heading into 2020. But, but Mike is, I guess, as we uh, maybe supplement Keith's comments here. As we exit 2020, we, we don't think there's going to be a net headwind. We think we've got, between the pricing actions and the supply chain actions that Keith mentioned, we think we've got the impact of the tariffs fully covered. All right, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, you know, secondly, I just wanted to uh, circle back to uh, Kitchell for a moment and apologize. Mm -hmm. I know you've answered a bunch of questions, but I'm just trying to make sure I have some of the numbers right and, and how to think about the business as it is, you know, by the end of this uh, year. Um, you know, John, I think you said that private label and inventory rebalancing would each be $15 million uh, in in the first couple of quarters going to five in, in the third quarter. Was that right? Yeah, maybe just to be clear, collectively, um, the private label and inventory rebalancing will be $15 million in each of Q1 and Q2. So total okay. impact in the year, Mike, of 35 from both of those actions. 
Okay. So I, I was just trying to get a sense of, you know, as the business has, and I assume you had maybe a 15 million hit in 4Q. Um, so you, you, you're talking somewhere in the range of 50 to 100, you know, 50 to maybe 75, depending on, you know, how things traversed in 2019, uh, you know, of a hit to revenue from your original purchase. Um, you know, you've also talked a lot about the different types of cost actions that you've done to improve the business. I was just trying to get a sense of, you know, with all the moving pieces, um, you know, how you would characterize the margins today, or by the end of 2020, rather, I think is more importantly, uh, for that business relative to where you purchased it. Are you kind of, you know, in line, you, you know, still a little bit behind or or even ahead given some of the, the company-specific actions? And how do you think about, you know, any potential further improvement in 21. Yeah, uh, Mike, so, you know, with respect to, to you know, the margins, you know, you know we, we don't break out margins by individual company. Um, you know, we can appreciate the, the, the question. You know, as Keith mentioned in his comments a couple minutes ago, you know, we continue to work and, and successfully work on the supply chain and cost out initiatives at Kistler. Uh, clearly, the volume has been a little bit more of a headwind than we had anticipated, would have anticipated when we bought the company. Um, but that's about as much as we can say on that topic. Okay. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of John Lovallo with Bank of America. Hey, guys. Um, thank you for taking my questions as well. Uh, just sticking with lighting here, and I'm, I don't mean to be a beat a dead horse here, but just from a broader industry perspective, I'm just curious. You know, there's been a number of, of headwinds, obviously, and, you know, you guys have handled them fairly well. Uh, the question is, though, are, is there any concern that there's something structurally changing in the lighting industry, you know, similar to maybe what we're seeing in cabinets and, and flooring as it pertains to consumer preference that is, that is creating a headwind here? No, I, uh, we, we don't view it as a structural change. If there was anything that would be approaching a structural change, it would be the, the shift to e-commerce. But that's really, we're, we're seeing that, honestly, pretty broadly across a number of our uh, product categories. So, no, it's not a, uh, we, we don't view it as a structural hit. It was definitely a, a significant change when you talk about an industry that's by and large imported from China and we have the kind of tariffs that we had come into there. So it's, it, that's, that's more of a, uh, a one-time event as, as it relates to the change versus a structure. Um, you know, there's, uh, it's a significant uh, component of the remodel process, and it continues to be that. It certainly is a design cue. It's very design forward. Uh, the, the, what it takes to win in this industry as it relates to uh, consumer intimacy and understanding design trends and having a product, um, a new product introduction process that's solid. Those, those things haven't changed. So we know how to compete in this industry, um, and the change really has been that that tariffs that came in, and we're going to put that behind us uh, throughout the course of 2020, and then we're going to return to a growth footing. Okay, thanks, Keith. And then, and then John, just on, on the SG&A front of 310 million in the quarter, that was up, you know, fairly meaningfully. Um, on a dollar basis and also as a percentage of sales. Can you just help us understand uh, maybe some of the, the, the key drivers under that, please? Yeah, sure, uh, John. We, you know, as you may recall, last fourth quarter was actually one of the lightest quarters we had in SG&A in a, in a long time. So it was maybe it was more of a, um, a low SG&A comp that we were up against. You know, the one thing that you may recall that we called out in the fourth quarter call of last year is we did have a $4 million uh, gain on the sale of a building, which did not occur, which would be a – you know, would be headwind against that comp. But uh, I think it was more just extremely tight uh, or low SG&A last year on a kind of a one-off basis as opposed to anything else. Okay. Thanks, guys. Your next question comes from the line of Justin Spear with Zellman and Associates. Hi, good morning, guys. Appreciate it. I just wanted to unpack some of your more margin forecasts. You mentioned the 300 basis point headwind in the first quarter being more uh, – out of the decorative architectural segment being more tariff affected, but but then I'm trying to reconcile that with the fact that you you obtain price. So are you just saying that it's volume deleverage, or is there something else? Is there a lag in your pricing relative to the cost rolling through? Maybe help me understand that. 
uh, and then and then also on top of that, just the any tailwind from lower raw material costs across your business, lower and, and easing transport costs, or any any other factors that are offsets that we need to be aware of. Yeah. So, Justin, a couple of questions in there. Let me uh, let you try to address those. So, um, in terms of the, the margin uh, degradation from you know the, the fourth quarter to uh, Q1, there's there's a couple of things going on there. One is lower volumes, right? Uh, you know, we, we referenced the fact that we we lost a portion of the private label program. Um, also, with the pull forward in paint, um, you know, that $20 million obviously comes out. Well, that, that should indicate we have lower volumes in Q1. We're anticipating lower volumes, I guess I should say, uh, in Q1 in the decorative architectural segment that, that would help drive that operating uh, profit margin lower. Um, in terms of raw material costs, uh, I, and the third thing I should I guess I should impact, uh, say is um, on the margin side is the tariffs because it's cost recovery that will drive you know margins lower as well. Uh, you know on the offset side, yeah, obviously we always work on cost productivity. Um, in terms of commodity costs specifically, um, you know the, the input costs to, to paint have moderated. Uh, here in the uh, since a year ago, uh, but recall the way uh, things work with particularly with our paint business is that um, you know they're uh, you know we tend to be price cost neutral over time, and so um, that may have an Im- you know that would impact margins. So there's really um, you know is is prices moderate um, uh, input costs moderate. There may there may be. Um, some impact uh, on pricing as well. Uh, so I think that that puts it all together. Um, did I hit all your questions? Well, I guess I'm just trying to understand it because I know there's a lot of unevenness with the paint because last year, I guess in the first quarter of 20, 2019, your your comps were down 7%. I know some of that was Kitchler, but that was because you had pull forward the prior year. So I would have thought that those would have kind of evened out. Um such that you wouldn't have as much of an impact there from the coding side and obviously of the Kitchler business. But I'm just trying to reconcile your comment that it's mostly tariffs that are hitting you. Is it? It's not the tariff cost. It's that you're trying to get price and you've lost share as a result of that or losing business, and that's affecting your margin profile in the, in the decorative architectural segment. No, I, I, don't, I don't know if you – maybe I didn't communicate right, but I, I think um, as you go into Q1, you know, I'd say there's going to be lost volume. We talked about the lost programs, and so that's going to be the main contributor to the margin degradation, um, followed by um, the, uh, the, the the tariff impacts. Of the two, volume is the much greater impact than the, the tariffs on, on the margins and key. That makes sense. And then, lastly, for me, is just who are you who are you losing share to in in the lighting business? Is there perhaps another player that doesn't source from China that's advantaged post tariffs? Because I I was under the impression that everyone is kind of in the same sandbox, so to speak, in terms of the supply chain. Is it or is it something else? Well, I think the industry is down. I think the the, the impact of the tariffs industry wide has been in effect. Um, we're not. We haven't really identified any. A uh, single uh, competitor that's particularly uh, taking more share than than another one, than across the board. Okay, thank you, guys. Your next question will come from the line of Keith Hughes with SunTrust. Yeah, thank you. Um, can you give us in 2019 what was North American plumbing growth? North American plumbing growth. Uh, was two percent, uh, I think, for the full year. Uh, Keith. Was that all volume, yeah. or was there pricing in there? Uh, there was a little bit of pricing uh, in there. Well, yeah, I mean, if you consider the tariffs, actually, a fair amount of pricing in, in there. Because we we put in price to offset the tariff impact, Keith, probably in Q1 and Q2 of the of last year. Okay. And so. Um, you're not expecting, and I think you said this earlier, you're not expecting any price in this plumbing uh, guys that you've given us for, uh, uh, again, let me ask you this way. In North America, you don't expect any price coming in in, in 2020 in plumbing? Uh, not much, Keith. There might be a little bit that, that uh, we put in, but not, not a ton, no. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Phil Ing with Jeffries. Hey, guys. 
Um, can you give us a sense how we should think about the pace of the buybacks as you layer that in um, in 2020? And then uh, any update on the M&A pipeline? You know, in terms of uh, – I'll take the, uh, the the share repurchase question, Phil, and I'll let uh, Keith talk about the M&A pipeline. Um, you know, in terms of, of the way we're thinking about it is, is I think we mentioned, you know, we'll probably do a um, – a, a large portion, maybe uh, a good chunk of the, the proceeds that we get from uh, the chemistry transaction shortly there, shortly after the proceeds are received. So, and then um, you know through the balance of the year, we look to deploy the, uh, the balance of the you know five to six hundred million that we discussed. Um, and but we'll be, that would probably be more opportunistic depending on how the market plays out. You know, in terms of M&A uh, pipeline, Keith, why don't you take that? Yeah. So our pipeline remains solid. Um, we continue to drive it. Uh, overall, I would say that the M&A activity uh, was a little bit slower in 19 than I expected with the global trade uncertainty and some of the business valuations being in flux because of that. Um, but it seems to pick up, have picked up lately. Um, we like some of the things that we're looking at. Most of them are fairly small. Um, I would say that seller expectations still remain high, so we're going to be patient. Um, but a solid pipeline. Got it. And just one last one for me. Uh, on the lighting stuff, I mean, obviously there's some tariff dynamic and share loss. As we think about 2021, when you work through some of these issues, and you got to keep mentioning you expect to return to growth, should we expect margins in that segment decorative to kind of get back to that 18 to 19 percent range? Well, we're going to continue with that growth. We have a good drop down on that incremental volume, <clears throat> and we'll continue to drive that. So I would expect that. Um, margins would be improving as we compare 20 to 21. Okay. Yeah, Phil, you mean recall we laid out uh, 17 and a half to 18% margins in that segment for our investor day in September, and you know we, you know, our thought process around that has not changed since uh, September. Got it. Thanks a lot. Our final question will come from the line of Truman Patterson with Wells Fargo. Hi. Good morning, guys. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, First one to, to touch on the coronavirus again, um, you, you know, could you dig into that a little bit more? You know, what portion of plumbing products have, you know, a, comp a component piece sourced from China? And, Keith, I believe you, you, you mentioned conting contingency plans as well. Um, just trying to, to understand what's going on there. Um, and, you know, it, it does seem like it's intensifying. Could you discuss, you know, your current inventory balances and maybe an update um, of uh, uh, your supply chain if plants actually remain shut for, you know, another week or two? Will that actually impact, you know, the product that you can get on shelves? Our, uh, our factories are coming up to speed. Um, really, that represents about a week um, of delay over what would normally be have, have been a delay related to the Chinese New Year. So they're coming up. They're coming up a little bit slower than um, what they would normally. Uh, we have about 15% of our workforce in our biggest plant, for example, and that's going to be coming in through uh, the course of the, the next week, week and a half. Um, as I said earlier, from a volume perspective, um, a, a lot of the uh, retail home improvement malls and, and dealers remain closed, and they'll be opening anticipated. Again, there's a lot in flux here, uh, but they'll be opening over the course of the next week or two. Um, so with China representing 3% of our revenue, as I said in, in an earlier answer on the Q&A session here, we're not anticipating it to have a material impact on us. Um, in terms of contingencies, as I said, we're, we're looking at premium freight to help us with some of uh, the delivery so that we can maintain our outstanding fill rate and lead time proposition to the customers. Um, and we're <clears throat> continuing to keep an eye on it. We're, we're most keenly um, paying attention to the health of our employees, and we've got um, different procedures and policies to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to that first and foremost. It's a it's a um, a fluid situation. We're watching it closely, and as I said, we're not anticipating it to have a material impact on our results at this time. Okay, okay, thanks for that. And then on the R and R side, you know, pretty pretty slow in 2019. Um, it looks like your guidance has R and R picking up a little bit here. Are, are you actually seeing activity start to recover early in 2020? 
Um, and if so, do you think, you know, weather has had any impact on that? I'm just trying to understand how sustainable, you know, any kind of near-term uh, green shoots are, are. Yeah, I think that, you know, the weather's been pretty good, um, uh, all things considered and, and what, it, what, it, what it could have been. We're, we're calling R&R at that 3 to 4% growth range, and we see it accelerating towards the back half. It, when we're looking at the numbers uh, and the, the economic indicators that we look at, generally there's lag uh, from those numbers to R&R. So uh, we feel com- confident in that 3 to 4% R&R with acceleration in the back half. Ladies and gentlemen, that will conclude today's conference call. Thank you all for joining, and you may now disconnect.